Okay. Um, so yes, welcome. Um, again, this is the third talk in our lecture series, The Art of Relationships, sponsored jointly by Stony Brook University Libraries and the Pavlik Krasner House and Study Center. The series, um, which complements the Pollock Krasner House's current exhibition, Creative Exchanges, Artists in Jackson Pollock and Lee Krasner's Address Books, is made possible by a generous gift from Dorothy Lichtenstein and Stony Brook's John H. Marburger III Memorial Fund. Um, I would like, I'm going to introduce you to today's speaker, Elizabeth Smith. Um, before I do, I just want to make sure that uh, Everyone knows we're going to do Q&A at the end of, of the lecture, in which case you could put questions in the chat. You're free to put questions in the chat throughout if you would like, but we're going to do the Q&A at, at the end. Okay. Elizabeth Smith, the executive director of the New York-based Helen Frankenthaler Foundation um, since 2013, is an art historian, curator, author, and educator, Previously, she was executive director for curatorial affairs at the Art Gallery of Ontario, chief curator and deputy, deputy director of programs at the Museum of Contemporary Art, Chicago. If everyone can just remain muted until um, the Q&A, sorry, I'm admitting people. Uh, okay, sorry, I'm just gonna start that sentence over. There, um, Previously, she was executive director for curatorial affairs at the Art Gallery of Ontario, chief curator and deputy director of programs at the Museum of Contemporary Art, Chicago, and curator at the Museum of Contemporary Art, Los Angeles. Besides her scholarship on Frankenthaler, Elizabeth has published and lectured widely in the visual arts and architecture. She has organized exhibitions of the work of such artists as Lee Pontecu, Jenny Holzer, Carrie James Marshall, Donald Moffat, Catherine Opie, and Cindy Sherman, and on architecture, including Blueprints for Modern Living, History and Legacy of the Case Study Houses, and At the End of the Century, 100 Years of Architecture. Her recent essays have appeared in a 2021 monograph on Catherine Opie and the catalog for the Whitechapel Gallery's 2023 exhibition, Action, Gesture, Paint. Women Artists and Global Abstraction, 1940 to 70. Elizabeth was educated at Barnard College and Columbia University and has taught at the University of Southern California School of Fine Arts, the School of the Art Institute of Chicago and Bennington College, where she was a visiting professor in the Museum Fellows Term Program. Today, she will consider some of Frankenthaler's earliest works and will reflect on what made Frankenthaler's painting in Morris Lewis' later words, a uh, quote, bridge between Pollock and what was possible, end quote, for other artists in the 1950s. So please join me in welcoming Elizabeth Smith. Elizabeth, I give it to you. Thank you, Victoria, for that nice introduction. Can everybody hear me okay, I hope? Okay, good. Uh, well, I'm delighted to be here this afternoon and I wanna thank all of you for spending your Sunday afternoon uh, with me on what's turned out to be a really nice day. So I'm very pleased to be asked to talk to you about Helen Frankenthaler in the context of the exhibition now at Pollock Krasner House. When I was considering how to frame my talk today, I was thinking about, you know, whether to really just stick to, you know, that early period when Frankenthaler knew and was being influenced by and was socializing with Pollock and Krasner or whether I should you know, go more broadly in my talk. And I re-encountered a quote that I thought was a perfect title for my lecture today. Uh, it's a quote from the poet Frank O'Hara, who wrote about the attributes of Frankenthaler's painting in an essay that accompanied her first museum survey at the Jewish Museum in 1960. And he used these words that you see on your screen, inclusive and generous, free ranging and enthusiastic. I find those words to be a very apt description of Frankenthaler's painting practice, both in its early phases and throughout and across the arc of her career over the subsequent decades. It's a sensibility and an attitude that motivated her and that opened her up to a wide spectrum of artistic influences while she was finding her own way as a young artist and in turn made her work influential on 
uh, a number of her peers, including Morris Lewis and Kenneth Noland. Uh, and she continues to be influential to uh, generations of younger generations of artists, including those from our own time, I, in my view, precisely because of these attributes of her painting. Whoops, I'm trying to move forward. Okay, there we go. Um, the premise of the exhibition Creative Exchanges, which is now at the Pollock Krasner House, is a focus on artists who were part of Pollock and Krasner's orbit as documented in the address books of the artists. It's a, it's a brilliant premise, and I want to congratulate the curators of the show, Teresa Davis and James Bauer, and of course, Helen Harrison. Um, and I'm sorry that, that they're not able to be with us today. The Helen Frankenthaler Foundation is pleased to have lent this work that you see on the screen to the exhibition. It's an early piece from 1951 titled Cloudscape. It's a painting of oil, sand, and coffee grounds on canvas. We chose it because it was made during this crucially formative period for Frankenthaler when she was absorbing the impact of Pollock, as well as other key abstractionists um, of the New York School at that time. And she was also getting to know Pollock and Krasner personally and socially. It's a strong example of the kind of exploration that this young artist was undertaking. And she was only 22 when she made this painting um, before she developed the soak staining technique for which she became later known and that propelled her practice forward in a direction that was influenced by, but also took off from the painting of Pollock. We're fortunate that uh, Frankenthaler's life and work of the 1950s has been studied quite extensively. It's it's been you know exhibited, written about, um, and published uh, in several recent catalogs and exhibitions. Uh, just a few of them. I want to I want to name for you. Um, a decade ago, shortly after Frankenthaler's death in 2011, John Elderfield, who remains the preeminent scholar on Frankenthaler's work, curated an exhibition called Painted on 21st Street that was presented at Gagosian in 2013, and he wrote the accompanying catalog. In 2015, art historian Katie Siegel, uh, who I know is, is associated with, uh, with Stony Brook, published the book, The Heroine Paint After Frankenthaler, wherein she positioned aspects of Frankenthaler's work as a touchstone for practices of certain later artists. And then a little bit more recently in 2018, Mary Gabriel, published her book, Night Street Women. I hope you all are have are familiar with it, have heard of it, even if you haven't read it. It's it, it's quite a quite a thick tome, but um, but it's a really great portrayal of not just Frankenthaler, but also several other women artists of the period. And in 2021, Alexander Nemirov published his um, look at his treatment of Frankenthaler's life and work in the 1950s in this book titled Fierce Boys. Helen Frankenthaler and 1950s New York. Today, my focus will be on the earlier part of the 50s, um, but I will also touch on works made during the later part of the decade and on the subsequent evolution of Frankenthaler's work um, after, following the 50s. Of great importance to Frankenthaler's formative years was her study at the Progressive Bennington College in the late 1940s. And there she studied with the artist Paul Feely, who was then a proponent of cubism. You can see Paul Feely standing behind Frankenthaler while she's painting what looks like a fairly conventional um, uh, portrait um, on her easel. And uh, Bennington proved to be, you know, a particularly fertile ground for this young artist, uh, being not only exposed to Feely, uh, who was, you know, really a, a very, you know, intensive and intent uh, teacher, um, but also who encouraged his students to study earlier works, uh, to study, you know, paintings by the old masters or by some of the earlier modernists and really sort of dissect these paintings to get at what made them work, what made them good paintings. And this was an education that Helen Frankenthaler digested and that she used, you know, she, she took those lessons with her throughout the development of her um, entire career. After graduating from Bennington in 1949, she moved back to New York City where she had been born and raised. And she set up a studio on East 21st Street, 
It was an exciting time, as you can imagine, for an ambitious young painter to begin finding her way in the small but vibrant community of those dedicating themselves to progressive art making at that time. In May 1950, she met the influential critic Clement Greenberg by inviting him to a show that she helped organize of Bennington alumni artists at Jock Seligman Gallery. They quickly became a couple, and the older, more knowledgeable Greenberg became a very important source of access, information, and intellectual stimulation for the young Frankenthaler, who later described herself in that period as, quote, eager to look at and eager to learn from everything and everyone, end quote. It was Greenberg who encouraged Frankenthaler to study with Hans Hoffmann, the German emigre abstractionist, at his summer school in Provincetown, Massachusetts. She did so in summer 1950, and we see her in this photograph during those weeks of study at, at Hoffman Summer School, but she did stay there only three weeks because she felt she was already well-grounded in the methods that he was teaching, which centered uh, uh, a good deal on cubism. This untitled painting on the screen is not the same one that we just saw on the easel of Helen uh, painting in Provincetown but it's a related example that gives a good idea of the variance of the cubist inspired style that underpinned much of her painting at that time and that she was continuing to work through in this period. This painting, Beach, also from 1950, is significantly more abstracted and material in its use of sand and coffee grounds and plaster of Paris to create a textured surface. But most importantly, it's considerably freer and looser in its execution. The linear elements are dispersed sort of across and throughout the surface of the painting. And Frankenthaler has clearly taken a step forward, a notable step forward with this work. It happened to be included in 1950 in a group exhibition at the Samuel Coutts Gallery called 15 Unknowns selected by the artists of the Coutts Gallery. And it was the artist Adolf Gottlieb, the Coutts Gallery artist, who chose this painting of Helen's for inclusion. He had seen it in Clement Greenberg's apartment on a visit there. So it was a sort of a lucky break for Helen to um, be included uh, in that show that early. Beach seems quite related to the work that's now on the screen, titled Painted on 21st Street, also from 1950. It has similar formal attributes, yet it's much larger in size, and it appears lighter and airier, while it simultaneously appears more material and textured with the more evident use of the plaster of Paris across and over the surface of the work. Later that year, this is still 1950, Frankenthaler had her first substantial contact with Pollock's painting when she saw his November 1950 show at Betty Parsons Gallery with Clement Greenberg. There she saw paintings such as Autumn Rhythm on the screen now and others shown there for the first time. She later described this experience as thrilling and she likened it to being thrown into a ring at Madison Square Garden or going to a new country, not knowing the language but feeling that one had to learn it. And she said, and I quote, the first time I was surrounded by his pictures at the gallery, I was in shock of recognition that what I saw and felt was great painting. It held a basic message for me that I needed to understand. I was puzzled, but determined to understand because as a young artist, I had no choice. I simply innately knew it made beautiful sense. I had to take it as my lead, end quote. She was getting to know Pollock and Krasner socially at this time, also through Greenberg. And uh, Alex Nemirov's book recounts how she first met Pollock just the previous night before his show when she and Greenberg had dined with him and Krasner. The four of them continued to socialize. And, and in this picture, you see them at Eddie Condon's nightclub, favored spot of the time, in early 1951. It was also around that same time that Lee Krasner shared Frankenthaler's studio for a while while she and Pollock were spending an extended period in New York City. They were staying at the painter Alfonso Oforio's, Osorio's place, but Krasner needed a place to work. So Helen um, you know, said, sure, come, come on, share my studio. Uh, and interestingly, she wrote in a letter to her friend, Sonia Rudikoff about Krasner. And she said, quote, she's a strong, aggressive 40-year-old Bennington type. And I must say, it makes me assert myself. However, I don't think it will harm to have someone around. And she's pleasant and a good critic, I understand, for a while, end quote. 
It's interesting to consider how the impact of Pollock's painting manifested itself on Helen Frankenthaler's work during this transitional period, the year between which she saw his 1950 show at Betty Parsons, November 1950, until the following November of 1951, when she had his second show. Her painting and her thinking about painting was clearly evolving and reflecting the influence of Pollock and others in various ways. And one of those ways was in terms of scale or sheer size, I should say. This piece titled Ed Winston's Tropical Gardens with its exaggerated horizontal format is 191 inches long. It approaches the dimensions of Pollock's autumn rhythm, which is 207 inches long. The painting's vigorous dynamic linearity also reveals the young Frankenthaler striving to use her arm rather than just the wrist as a way to open up and energize her painting. So these, these were like cues and lessons she was taking from Pollock. But there are also many elements in this work that depart from Pollock, not the least of which is the jaunty, even kitschy color palette that suggests the environment of the nightclub for which it is titled and the many different kinds of mark making and biomorphic shapes throughout the painting that are reminiscent of de Kooning or even Gorky. In fact, she had visited and been impressed by a memorial exhibition of Gorky's work at the Whitney Museum early in 51. And of course, she was also quite familiar by this time with de Kooning's work that she would have seen in various exhibitions. On the left, there's an untitled painting of 1951 in which you see the impact of Adolf Gottlieb um, quite clearly to my mind, uh, in terms of the horizontal division of the painting into two distinct zones differentiated by color, a kind of landscape-like uh, division, as well as the heavy assertive black lines used throughout. And on the right, we see the young Frankenthaler who has now moved from her 21st Street studio to East 10th Street, where she sublet a space from the sculptor David Hare when he went off to France for a year. May 1951 was also the time of the Ninth Street exhibition of painting and sculpture. And the untitled painting that I just showed you on the screen was Frankenthaler's um, contribution to the Ninth Street show. That was the painting that she chose to include there. Participation in this show was a pivotal event for her and many of the other artists who participated. Pollock and Krasner, of course, also were included. Uh, and and it's, it's quite a large group of other artists. I always find it fascinating to peruse the names on this poster. Um, it's a really extraordinary microcosm of those who were devoting themselves to avant-garde art in New York at that time, uh, and who would later become known as the abstract expressionists, both first generation and second generation. There's also um, quite a large number of women participants here, which I think is also important to note. Helen was the youngest participant in the show, and she also had one of the largest paintings. So I'd like I'd now like to show you a few additional examples of paintings and works on paper she made during this important transitional year of 1951 that um, reveal her keen awareness of work by artists who were defining for the younger generation of which she was a part. Uh, and I, you know, I'll mention again Gorky, de Kooning, Gottlieb, and Pollock, as well as lessons she had absorbed from viewing a lot of work by the earlier modernists, Miro, Kandinsky, even Matisse. During this period, she was working with a frenzied kind of energy in her studio, fueled by a sense of excitement and ambition and reflecting on what she was doing and seeing. In a journal entry she'd written in 1950 that's published in John Elderfield's Painted on 21st catalog, she said, quote, there are no flat rules for getting at the workings of a painting, but I find more than ever that the secrets lie in ambiguity. A line is a line, but is a color. It does this here and it does that there. The canvas surface is flat, yet the space extends for miles. What a lie, what trickery, how beautiful is the very idea of painting." End quote. So some of these works from 51 uh, include Village on the screen now, uh, it's a work that has great compositional strength and visual interest with a wealth of painterly passages and marks, gestures that give the work a great vitality. And in the density of its composition, it shows the impact of de Kooning. The smaller work called Downtown is, is more open and airier 
and possibly recalls um, the impact of Gorky. This abstract landscape has a more, much more structured appearance with clearly and seemingly very deliberate deliberately defined forms and a much brighter palette. And Matisse has been pointed to uh, as an example of an artist uh, whose work Helen might have been digesting as she made this particular painting. And then this uh, quite small oil and charcoal on paper includes many of the attributes of the larger canvases I've just shown you. And I think important to remember, these were all made in 1951. So you, 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 know, you see this sort of rich, fertile, um, rest, restless experimentation that Frankenthaler is undergoing at the time. And I think that uh, these works taken together certainly embody the idea that uh, later was articulated by O'Hara about Frankenthaler's work being inclusive and generous, free ranging and enthusiastic. 1951 was also an important year for Helen in terms of um, her exhibitions. She was included in a group show of five artists at the Tybor Dinage Gallery. The other artists included were Robert Goodnow, Al Leslie, Harry Jackson, and Grace Hardigan, who was at that time going by the name George Hardigan. Uh, and of course, she and Grace Hardigan and Al Leslie would uh, later become great friends. By June 1951, she had completed this work called The Sightseers. And I think this is a very exciting and interesting painting for many reasons. Uh, it shows us a great interplay between heavier dark lines and more slender ones that meander throughout and across the entire surface of the composition, which has very much an overall quality. There's no sort of beginning and end here. There's no focal point necessarily on which our eye can rest. And it reveals the influence of both Pollock and de Kooning quite possibly the latter's painting Excavation, which had been shown the previous year. Uh, but uh, uh, look closely and you'll see also a notable and interesting characteristic. You'll see the word Helen spelled out in the middle of the painting about midpoint. That's Frankenthaler's calligraphic use of her own name as both a signature and a compositional element. And of course it has a touch of great wit and flair uh, being presented and included uh, in quite this way. July and August 51 were spent with Greenberg up in Bennington, Vermont. And these two works could have been made during that time. They're certainly titled in such a way. In a letter to a friend, Frankenthaler wrote, quote, we're doing lots of painting. We go outdoors for a few hours, mornings or afternoons and do watercolors. And then in the evening, we go to the studio. I've done three or so smallish canvases and one large, end quote. These two works and Cloudscape, which now you can see at the Pollock Krasner Center show, were all included in Frankenthaler's first solo exhibition at the Tibor Dinage Gallery in November, December, 1951. She received pretty you know, interesting, pretty, pretty good feedback, pretty good critical response came out of this show. Uh, and among those reviews was one by the painter Paul Brock who called her, quote, imaginative, fearless, and immensely talented. And he went on to say, her frequent borrowings are never that of discipleship. The motifs she takes serves as points of departure for her own explorations, end quote. So I think, you know, he's, he's really acknowledging, you know, the fact that she's a young artist looking around, uh, experimenting, taking things from multiple sources, but uh, with a seemingly uh, inventive sensibility of her own that, um, uh, and that she was a person to watch. Frankenthaler and Greenberg, Pollock and Krasner continued to spend time together at times with other artists. Uh, and in October, 1951, they went up to visit David Smith and his wife, Jean Frias at Smith's Bolton Landing Studio. Uh, that month, October 51, was certainly an important one for Lee Krasner who had a show at the Betty Parsons Gallery then. And Pollock's second show there was about to take place just one month later in November of that year. During the first part of 52, Frankenthaler continued to work in the studio and to present her work in group exhibitions. That spring, in company of artist Larry Rivers, she visited Pollock's studio, which had an immense impact on them both. And in June 1952, she made two paintings that, that I'm, I'm showing you here. Here's the first one. Uh, these are interesting for us to look at in light of the continuing developments in her work. This one titled Window Shade Number 1. 
um, it manifests a similar meandering linearity and the presence of biomorphic shapes as seen in the pieces I've showed you earlier. Um, yet here, she's seemingly paying more attention to the edge conditions of the painting, or in this companion piece, she's experimenting with this, you know, very strong vertical um, linearity that bisects uh, the canvas into two parts, and she's using a more muted palette, but always uh, this idea of, of ambiguity, the ambiguity of the of, of gesture and, and what it is she is painting is always um, at the forefront in her thinking and her and in her practice. In summer 52, Frankenthaler and Greenberg visited Pollock and Krasner in Springs, and here she had the opportunity to gain much closer and more sustained contact with the work. And I'd like to share some comments she made about this from the transcript of a lecture she gave at the Pollock Krasner House in 1994. And during that lecture, which incidentally was introduced by Helen Harrison, Helen Frankenthaler said, I quote, in the early 1950s, seeing his recent paintings unrolled on the barn floor, taking it all in, bantering over them, walking around their four sides on the barn floor or hanging them on the wall, turning them all different ways, looking, looking, coming back that night to look again and the next day to look again. And sometimes the pictures on the floor were still wet. One of these was blue poles. I recall vividly seeing it on the floor and the very mixed discussion about it, even how it got its name, end quote. So this photo of Helen Clement Greenberg and um, Lee Krasner at Springs would have been on one of those visits that Hank Frankenthaler just described. And of course, I, I had to show you, I can't neglect to show you this photograph of the four together on the beach uh, during that same visit in July 52. And someday we will learn the identity of the fifth person in this photograph, who's now only known to us as an unidentified child. Um, I, I know that some archivist or somewhere uh, will help us uh, determine uh, who he is. In early fall 52, Frankenthaler moved her studio from 10th Street to 23rd Street, sharing it now with the artist Friedel Zubas. And it's important and interesting now for us to think about and consider Frankenthaler's own account of the impact of Pollock to her early development, leading up to the making of uh, her best known painting on the screen now, Mountains and Sea. In her 1994 Pollock Krasner House lecture, she said, quote, before his breakthrough show in, 1950, in November 1950, I had, since that previous spring, great opportunity to look at Jackson's work from the 40s. The work of that period and the early abstract de Kooning's influenced my young painting of 1950-51. Their influences on my work are especially obvious up to and around the fall of 1952 when I made Mountains and Sea. Even by then, de Kooning's kidney shapes and general sense of enclosure offered less to me than Jackson's signature and style. What appealed to me was Jackson's ropey skeins of enamel webbing working from the shoulder, not the wrist, end quote. Uh, and that idea of working from the shoulder uh, reveals to us the significance of the, the physicality with which Pollock painted. And that was an attribute that Franca Buller herself wanted to, to get to. And in this painting, she did. In October 1952, following a summer visit, she and Greenberg had made to the Cape Breton area of Nova Scotia, where the dramatic coastal landscape made a great impression on her. The catalytic impact of Pollock's painting finally broke through. When she made the landmark Mountains and Sea, her decision to lay unstretched, unprimed canvas on the floor and to apply oil paint thinned with turpentine to a watery consistency over and across its surface using dynamic physical movements to do so sprang in part from her admiration of Pollock's approach to painting, but also equally resulted from her desire to capture the memory of the feeling of the landscape itself. And later she commented, the landscape was in my arm as I did it. This work uh, that she titled 102952 was painted three days after Mountains and Sea. It shows a continued experimentation with the possibilities of this new technique. The color is similar to what we see in Mountains and Sea, but this painting is much more overtly linear with the presence of bold, circular or semicircular forms, lines, uh, pronounced biomorphic forms and passages of frenzied bark making from which a kind of nervous energy emanates. And you can see those in, in several different zones of the painting, I hope even on this slide. The same month, 
1052. We're, we're so happy that she, you know, um, put the dates on her painting in this way. Uh, she used the technique in this work called Scene with Nude. It's an exceptional work in the degree of frank representation of a body here. It's unusual for Frankenthaler to do that. Uh, and she conveys this um, bodily form uh, via the fluid soak stain technique and the pronounced linearity of drawing with color, which was becoming more and more uh, a, a way uh, that she sought uh, to make enlivened painting. As she moved into 1953, um, this work called Open Wall shows her growing mastery of control of the medium through the presence of forceful planes of large areas of color laid in adjacency to one another, deftly positioned in that way. There's also in this work a strong sense, uh, to my eyes, of foreground and background indicative of the urge towards spatiality that Frankenthaler had retained from her cubist beginnings. This, this is a very, you know, quite a large painting, 131 inches um, long, uh, that's quite magisterial in size. The same year, she made this work called Shatter. It's much smaller and it's very different from the one we've just seen. The palette color, the color is different, the sensibility is different, and it has a centered rather than a horizontally oriented composition. In March 53, the four, um, Frankenthaler, Greenberg, Pollock, and Krasner went up to Bennington, Vermont to visit Paul Feely and his wife, Helen Feely. And it was in April 1953 that Morris Lewis and Ken Noland visited Frankenthaler's studio and saw Mountains and Sea. And the work made a great impact on them. It led them both to alter their way of working to a method approximating Frankenthaler's experiments. And Lewis later acknowledged Frankenthaler as a bridge between Pollock and what was possible, indicating the importance of what she had done to show them a way of opening up their practices. By the middle of the decade, Frankenthaler and Greenberg had ended their relationship, but Frankenthaler remained a frequent visitor in the Hamptons, socializing with Pollock and Krasner, as well as the growing group of artists and writers, poets, editors who summered or made pilgrimages there to visit others. This photo of a, of a group of, of such individuals uh, seated on the beach vividly documents the casual spirited gatherings among this expanded cohort. Um, associated with avant-garde New York in the early or, or mid 50s at this time. And Helen Frankenthaler is the third from left and beside her is Grace Hardigan. And we think that it may be the artist Sam Francis on the far left, we're not sure. Um, we hope, again, we hope someone can like verify at some point uh, all the other people in this photograph. It would be interesting to know. So I wanna show you a few more examples of Frankenthaler's painting made during the second half of the 1950s. They reveal the increasing range of her formal vocabulary, the diversity of her references and points of departure from literary to art historical, and the growing importance of conveying the mood of a place or a landscape in abstract terms. This work on the screen was titled after the name of a hotel where Helen was staying in Paris in 1956. Coincidentally, she was there in August 1956, at the same time as Lee Krasner, who on August 6th of that year received the news that Pollock had been killed. Frankenthaler that same day ended up, you know, going over to where Krasner was staying and um, helping, you know, communicate the news to others. Uh, she made this painting um, in her hotel room using paper, using the brown paper lining from the drawer of her hotel room as a, as a surface and including nail polish among the other mediums, watercolor, gouache, and tape on paper. We don't know whether or not she made this in response to the news of Pollock's death. It's, it's possible, but it's also entirely possible that it had, you know, it was made at a different time before she learned the news had nothing to do with that. But it's still an interesting example of how she was um, experimenting in that place at that particular time. This painting, Eden, was the largest work she had made to date, also in 1956. Here, uh, the spirit or the space of a garden is evoked. You can see evocation of trees, growing things, possibly a sun in the sky. Yet the painting remains resolutely abstract and even, even has some sort of puzzling symbolic elements in it. For instance, the number 100 repeated twice in the center of the canvas or 
are those just geometric elements, lines and circles? We don't really know. And Frankenthaler doesn't really want to tell us. For her, ambiguity always remained of paramount importance in her painting. And that notion was foregrounded further in a painting of uh, 1957 that she titled Seven Types of Ambiguity. This title derives from a book by the author William Empson that was first published in 1930 and that Helen had read while a student at Bennington College. Uh, it was a work about literary criticism and Empson, uh, or among the attributes of ambiguity that Empson identified were dilemmas, double binds, polarities, paradoxes, cognitive dissonances. These were all attributes that Frankenthaler became very interested in employing in her painting to achieve that sense of ambiguity. New York Bamboo from 1957 is one of the few black and white canvases that Frankenthaler made, and it has a very sort of unusual um, asymmetrical composition. Jacob's Ladder from 57 was apparently inspired by a work that she saw by the Spanish Baroque painter Giuseppe Ribera at the Prado called The Dream of Jacob. And this painting incidentally won first prize in the Paris Biennial of 1959 and is now in the collection of the Museum of Modern Art. The community of artists in the mid late 50s New York continued to be a cohesive one, especially among members of the so-called second generation. And you can see a gathering of Helen Frankenthaler uh, and other artist friends at the Five Spot, which was a favorite jazz club of the time. This was the year where she also began to achieve significant attention um, through various or in various forums, including this spread in Life Magazine, where she and several other young female abstract artists who were receiving attention were photographed by Gordon Parks, who's now you know legendary in his own right, but at that time was merely working as a staff photographer um, for Life Magazine. She was continuing to make major paintings. She was continuing to show in increasingly prestigious exhibitions. Her works were being acquired by museums later in the 50s, and she was really on her way, uh, and, and or one could say maybe had already um, achieved a, a great deal of success as an emerging artist who was still at that time not even 30 years old. She ceased visiting the Hamptons as frequently after 1957. Um, we don't know when, if, in precisely which summer this, this photograph was taken. It could have been 55, 56, or 57, but I thought it was a fitting way to conclude her Hamptons period. Uh, one of the reasons she stopped going to the Hamptons was um, due because of her marriage to Robert Motherwell in 1958, the much older um, abstract artist. Uh, and with him, she began to summer in Provincetown, Massachusetts, almost every summer following their marriage. Uh, and they, they also would travel to Europe quite frequently. And on the screen is also a painting that she made in 1959 called Winter Figure with Black Overhead. In 1960, she had her first museum solo exhibition at the Jewish Museum. It was a quite a significant event for her. The Jewish Museum was doing very progressive exhibitions at the time, showing young artists like Rauschenberg, um, as well as Frankenthaler. And uh, the 19 paintings presented in that show surveyed the previous decade of her practice. And again, she was still a very young artist. And this is, this is where Frank O'Hara described, you know, her work as inclusive and generous, free ranging and enthusiastic. This painting on the screen titled Alasio was uh, painted a bit too late to have been included in the, the 1960 exhibition, but I think it's a, it's a great example of what she was you know, doing um, in that year into the turn of a new decade. I think the, the, the dialogue between that square form, the brown square, which is by no means hard edge. In fact, it's, it's rather tremulous and looks you know, very hand painted in relation to what to my eyes appears to be something suggesting the form of a bird in flight is a quite exciting um, series of formal relationships as is Frankenthaler's um, you know, really assertive um, sort of brilliant use of a variety of bright colors uh, together with the color brown. 
Uh, I want to conclude now, um, since we've reached 1960, um, just by showing you a few additional examples of Frankenthaler's painting from um, across subsequent decades. This is, in my mind, uh, another of Frankenthaler's truly great paintings, Flood from 1967. It's owned by the Whitney. It was actually shown at the parish a few years ago. Any of you who saw the, the um, abstract climate show on Frankenthaler's Provincetown years hopefully remember seeing this painting. It exemplifies the idea of, that she um, called abstract climates that underlay her approach to the painting of landscape, uh, environment, and place. And the art historian Barbara Rose wrote about the elusive qualities of this painting in a way that I find very compelling. Barbara Rose said, quote, one does not look at the sky in its changing aspects. One has the sensation of being in the sky, of being exposed bodily to the warmth of sunlight and the churning notion or the churning motion of a gathering storm, end quote. I think that's a beautiful way to describe what you know, sort of comes across in this painting, what emanates from it as a kind of um, feeling or subject matter. But also it's another example of how Frankenthaler's mastery and control of, of the medium, the soak staining where she would pour um, paint onto the canvas. Again, she was always working on the floor, working horizontally uh, and moving the painting across the surface of the canvases, manipulating it with, you know, with various tools, brushes, her hands and her movements. Um, it's really an outstanding example of that at this moment in her, in her career. This example from the early 70s, New Paths, reveals how she was working in an expanded horizontal format at that time. This is a format that she deployed a great deal during the 1970s, and it also shows her renewed interest in line and linearity during this time. 4EM, a painting of the early 80s, is a great example of how Frankenthaler responded specifically to the work of old master artists and to earlier modernists. She would take specific works, such as the small painting by Edouard Manet, A Still Life with a Fish, that's in the collection of the Art Institute of Chicago, and she would abstract from these paintings. And, and, we, and we see her doing this at, you know, throughout really all the decades of her career. Um, this, I think, is a particularly brilliant example of how she manages to capture the spirit of the original small painting while creating an abstraction that is definitely her own and that is not in any way a, a direct sort of one-on-one -on -one translation of the, the representational nature of the original Manet. This painting of the late 80s called Toward Dark is, has a somber, majestic presence. Uh, it's, it's quite tall, uh, it's, it's extremely vertical. And the balance between lights and darks, between a, a kind of whitish gray and a, and a yellowish white and a, a dark backdrop is, um, is, is sober and somber. And one almost senses the, the references to two figures perhaps opposing each other. But of course, that's, that, that's entirely my reading. Uh, it could be and probably was in Helen's mind um, more completely an abstraction. Just a year later, she would make a painting like this one, Stargazing, and it's as sort of gay and joyous and buoyant as the previous one was, was somber um, and serious. Uh, th the way she's treated that area of blue that, that forms the, the primary area of the composition is, is absolutely dazzling in terms of its atmospheric qualities. You can see that the, uh, the color ranges from a deep indigo blue through all kinds of lighter shades of blue up to the, the palest blue sort of tinged with white. And this is of course suggestive, it's evocative of a sky, perhaps a night sky. And to my eyes, the orbs of pink, green, and white are um, or make me think of you know the the festive uh, festive hanging lights uh, you know in a cafe. So of course, again, this is entirely my reading. It's just what the work suggests to me. But but the mood and the evocation um, of, of of a condition of an emotion of perhaps the memory of a place, perhaps an event a feeling um, is all masterfully um, realized in this particular painting. And I wanna conclude my talk with two examples from the 90s 
these contrast a great deal to works done earlier in Frankenthaler's career, which were much more thinly painted with the soak stain technique that she had pioneered. These later works of the 90s tend to be much denser and more material. They are built up with, with many layers of paint and sometimes incorporate gel, which give them give areas and passages of the paintings an almost three-dimensional quality. They show evident mark making through tools and implements, including rakes. And I think you can see those, the, those striations perhaps more clearly in the painting on the right side of the screen titled Magnet. That work and a number of others were shown recently in New York uh, at an exhibition at Gagosian Gallery. And one reviewer commented that the paintings shown there revealed that Frankenthaler was still at the top of her game in her 60s, which I think was a, you know, a, a statement that, uh, you know, made me very happy uh, because the, in as I have become increasingly familiar with Frankenthaler's work during my years as executive director of the foundation, I have gained a much, you know, richer understanding of how she continued to experiment and push the language of abstraction in different directions over the years. She did not stay wedded to one style. Uh, her, hers is not a practice where all the paintings, you know, sort of resemble each other from, you know, start to finish of a career. They, they vary greatly and widely. And in that respect, um, I'll, I'll um, I continue to maintain that they are inclusive and generous, free ranging and enthusiastic. So with that, I will end, and I'd be delighted to hear any comments, questions from any of you. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you, Elizabeth. A fascinating talk um, on Helen Frankenthaler's early work. Um, I'm going to open, we do have some questions in the chat, so I'm just going to uh, get to those first. And if you left a message, um, please feel free to un unmute yourself. Uh, there's a question, I apologize, I can't um, scroll down so I can't see who asked it, but um, an attendee asked, did she use both soak stain and conventional painting on the front surface in the same painting? I'm yes, sure. yes, she did, she did. Um, I think one of the misconceptions about Frankenthaler's soak staining technique is that she only poured the paint. There are photographs, you know, that show her pouring, but what we know about her practice is that she, you know, she used brushes often and she used other kinds of tools. She would use her hands. So she would not just pour. Um, she wanted to achieve different kinds of effects in the surface of a painting. And so for that reason, she would use more conventional painting techniques as well. Great, thank you. Um, and another question from Mackenzie. Uh, was she priming her later acrylic on canvas works? Um, uh, she did tend to prime more in her later works, yes. And I think, I mean, I mentioned the, um, the, the, you know, the layering and the buildup and the density uh, in some of those later pieces, which is really, you know, a notable, uh, a notable aspect of her painting as it developed over time. But yes, you know, priming was something that, I mean, she did it earlier in her career as well. Um, at times, you know, she wasn't working only on unprimed canvas. She, she did go back and forth uh, over time, which again, I think is a, is a great, example of how she was not rigidly wedded to any one kind of idea or approach, but she allowed herself to do what felt right uh, at the time in response to each painting problem that she was uh, was um, approaching. Great. Um, someone left a message. Well, there's very nice comments. Uh, it was fantastic presentation. Um, Natasha left a, a link for her conversation with Charlie Rose from April 1993. There's a link in the chat about that. And so I definitely see the, I can just feel the enthusiasm with all the images <laughs> that you shared. And the experimental for the early works, the way she was dating um, the works with the month and the year, do you think that's because she she really saw them as like her experimental phase and wanted to kind of keep track of where she was in her experimentation? It's hard to know, but I would guess that that is the case. 
I mean, we, you know, as art historians, of course, it, yeah. it's absolutely fantastic that she did that because we can chart the course of, of, of different, of some of the pieces uh, that she made in that way. Uh, so I, I think she was quite self-conscious about what she was doing. You know, she, she, she was a, you know, incredibly sort of curious, um, interested, and just, you know, striving in every way to take as much as she could from what was around her, but, you know, channeling it into something that would be her own statement. And I think that her, you know, her, her dating of things in particular ways was maybe also, you know, sort of a note to herself about, uh, you know, what it is she was doing and in what sequence. Mm -hmm. I like it. <laughs> uh, we have another question. Uh, would you say a few words about coffee grounds as a medium or perhaps make a few comments about the conservation issues for workspace as time goes by? It's a great question. That's, well, uh, Michaela. Co yeah, coffee, I think there were a lot of coffee drinkers back then <laughs> as now. Um, but, you know, many of the artists were using coffee grounds in their painting, you know, to give that kind of sandy texture. Uh, and um, I have read that um, Dubuffet, that, that she looked at the painting of Dubuffet with interest uh, in her early period. And he, of course, you know, had that like wonderful, like texture um, in his pieces and that appealed to her. So as far as conservation issues go with things like coffee grounds, I'm sorry, I can't speak to that issue at all because I'm not a conservator and I don't know, you know, what would be entailed. But you do see that medium, you know, you see that material, I guess, being used in a number of pieces of that time by many artists. And we have another question um, from Marianne. Excellent presentation. Can you talk a bit about the activities um, the Helen Frankenthaler Foundation undertakes and what might be coming up in 2024? Certainly. Um, we are, um, well, our mission is to steward the legacy of artist Helen Frankenthaler and uh, to support um, the visual arts. We have a sort of a broad mandate. Uh, and the way we do that is through our uh, stewardship of our collection of works by Helen Frankenthaler. As you saw, many of the paintings I showed are our collection of, collection of the foundation. Um, our care of the archives and papers that she left to us. Uh, our care of her intellectual property. And um, in all ways, we seek to make these items um, available to the public. We, we steward them for the public benefit as an educational and philanthropic institution. So we lend to exhibitions, we welcome scholars to do research in our archives and to publish on Frankenthaler. We um, support you know, that research in any way we can. Uh, we support and help assist with public programs and we make grants to organizations. Um, we have in recent years developed quite an active grant making program with several different strands of activity. Uh, and I won't go further than that at this time, um, but you also asked about what's coming up in uh, 2024. There are a couple of things that we're really excited about that are on the horizon. Um, I don't know how much I can say about them yet, but I'll say as much as I can. Um, one is uh, a major publication that's going to be issued on Frankenthaler's entire career. Uh, you will hear more about that as 19, as uh, 2024 approaches. It's It will be a great contribution to the field because there has been no, you know, really major monograph that looks at the, the entirety of her career for quite some years. So it's time for an updated one. And there's also a major exhibition in the works um, being planned for Europe in, in 2024. And again, we'll be able to say more about that as that time approaches. So keep an eye on our website. And if you'd like to subscribe to our newsletter, please send us a note on our, on our info um, email account that you can find on our foundation's website. And we'll be glad to, to subscribe you to our periodic newsletter. Great. Um, and there's another comment from Beverly in Chicago. I am fascinated by Tort Dark. I agree with your observation of the suggestion of a figure. I see the figure as Gorky's mother as seen in Gorky's painting, Gorky and his mother. Thank you. Mm, that's uh, what an amazing observation. <laughs> that's incredible. Yeah, I love that. Um, does anyone have any other questions? Um, feel free to unmute yourself and ask, or you can put them in the chat. We have just a couple minutes left. And I did see a question about where this presentation or recording will be available. It will be available on the Stony Brook University Library's 
YouTube channel um, under an art and focus playlist, but this will be on the Stony Brook University Library's website. It'll be posted there. And I'm sure Helen um, will also, Helen Harrison from uh, the Pollock Krasner House and Study Center will also send out a link. And I will also be emailing all of you <laughs> the link once it is available. Thank you. Um, we have another. Can you speak a bit about the environmental concerns of the Frankenthaler Foundation? The environmental concerns. Um, you may be referring to our grant program called the Frankenthaler Climate Initiative. We are now in our third year of that program through which we give funds to museums and arts organizations who are seeking to uh, lower their energy use, uh, lower their climate footprint. And we, are, we make uh, various grants available for these organizations to make changes to their physical facilities that will cause them to consume less energy and save more money that they can use for their mission instead of for things like heating bills. We have funded at this point, I think more than 125 wow. museums and organizations around the US. And we will be announcing an additional cycle of grantees later this summer. It's an exciting initiative for us. And I believe we're the only private foundation that is funding in this particular way in the visual arts. That's great. That was the question was from David. Thank you, David. Um, do you have time for one more question? Okay, <laughs> I will ask, it's from Louise. Was the transition from large swaths of blank canvas to all encompassing paint coverage in the early 1960s, 63, 64, due to anything particular? like paint developments or just part of her evolution? I know that's when she moved from oil to acrylic. Thanks so much. Yeah, thank you for raising that point. I didn't mention it at all in my talk. She did in the early 60s, as you pointed out, um, switch from oil to acrylic. She just wanted to you know, find um, a medium that was like a bit more fluid, that had slightly different properties, that dried more quickly, that didn't leave the kind of halos that, that oil paint did. And around that time, she did experiment with like flooding the surface of some of her canvases with paint. Whereas around the same time, she would also make uh, paintings where there was very little of the canvas that was covered in paint. You know, again, really switching her, her direction uh, and trying different kinds of things out at the same time. She did just thinking quickly about like her whole career. Again, she, hmm, she would mix things up, you know, she would switch it around. I mean, I if, if you remember what I showed you from her two 1953 works, Open Wall, that horizontal painting with the big dark planes of color and Shatter, a piece that was sort of more like open and airy. You, you see the same kind of thing going on there. You see color almost across, you know, the entire surface of a canvas on the one hand and on the other, like a much more sparing, use of color in certain zones only. So she did, she did that, you know, throughout the years, actually. Again, you can never easily sort of pin her down in one specific way of working only. Great, thank you so much. Um, we've come to the end of this talk. I just wanna thank um, Elizabeth Smith again for this fascinating talk. And uh, thank you all for attending and we will See you next time. Thank you all so much for your attention. Have a great rest of your Sunday. Thanks. <laughs>